Let's talk about ultrasound in medicine. And you probably have an image of what this looks like. If a woman is pregnant and she wants to get it checked out, then we get an ultrasound. Ultrasound is the usage of sound waves to scan bodies, especially babies in the womb. No harmful effects are in ultrasound, unlike electromagnetic waves or radioactive decay, so scans that make use of this. For instance, x-rays use electromagnetic waves, and x-rays are rather high energy, so it can actually cause problems because it poses a threat for cancerous developments, and that's why the doctors rush out of the room after they've turned on the x-ray machine because they don't want to be exposed to a lot of x-rays. Um, ultrasound is nothing like that. It is not something that can cause cancer because this is sound waves. They're longitudinal and they are through media. There's just vibrations through media. So there's no harmful effects and it's very widely used in these photos, right? This photo is quite literally called an ultrasound. So you don't only detect babies, you also detect kidneys, kidney or gallstones, which are helpful for both males and females. So the main principle of ultrasound scanning is that sound is reflected at the boundaries between two media of different acoustic impediment values. So we're going to learn what that is later, but imagine you have two different media, like you have bone, which is much more dense, sound travels much faster in bone, and then you have like blood, which is less dense and sound travels significantly slower. At the boundary of these two different types of materials, sound is going to be reflected. I mean, some of it's going to go through to the bone, but some of it is also going to be reflected. So you detect those reflected waves in order to gain an image of something inside your very body. So a quick overview of ultrasound. Ultrasound is the sound above the human hearing range, which is 20 to 20 kilohertz. Um, however, most ultrasounds used in medicine has a frequency of a few megahertz, so way, way above our hearing range. Um, sound in air travels at around 330 meters per second, and in liquid or body tissue, which is mostly liquid, it is 1,500 1, meters per second. And, you know, in bone, more dense materials, it's going to be much higher than that, a few thousand meters per second. The wavelength of an ultrasound of 2.0 megahertz, which is usually used in medical ultrasound, it's around one millimeter. So that's the wavelength, right? And so that means that you can detect most structures that are one millimeter or bigger, because it's not going to miss out on something that's bigger than this. So how do you produce ultrasound, medical ultrasound? Um, and how do you get this photo? Well, the main character of the production of ultrasound is a piezoelectric crystal. And this is one that changes shape when an alternating current is applied to it. So it expands very slightly when the potential difference across it is in one direction. Let's say you reverse the potential difference direction, it will contract very slightly. So imagine if your alternating free current has a frequency in the megahertz range, then the crystal is going to expand and contract at the frequency of a few megahertz, millions of times per second. That's crazy. And the, if you look at the boundary itself, like let's say you have the crystal over here, and it's going to be expanding and then contracting and expanding and contracting. If you only look at this boundary, it's going to be vibrating extremely quickly. And this generates an ultrasound pulse because um, an ultrasound pulse is merely sound waves, right? Sound waves are just differences in pressures of air. So going like this and this and this is going to create differences of pressure, which is a sound wave. So the ultrasound pulse is reflected at various boundaries and sent back. So what detects these reflected waves? Because we know that the piezoelectric crystal produces them. Well, guess what? The detector is also the piezoelectric crystal. It works in a reverse manner as well. So which means that if you apply the stress, you know, if you change the shape because of like differences in pressure, this will also induce EMF within the crystal. So what, it's, what I'm saying is that if there is an induced EMF in, on the crystal, then it's going to change shape. But if the crystal is meant to change shape because of um, different pressures or whatever, then the crystal is also going to induce its own EMF. And the EMF induced gives information about 
the sound waves. So this is amplitude or intensity and the time delay, etc. So you can hook this up to a computer and this is analyzed by a computer to form an image. Hence, the piezoelectric crystal is a transducer, which is a device that transforms variations in a physical quantity to electrical signals or vice versa. You can see this visualization here. If you have an applied voltage to this crystal, it's going to have some sort of induced strain, so it's going to shrink or expand or something like that. Let's say the reflected wave allows, like it hits the crystal and it makes it shrink and expand and shrink and expand. This is going to induce an EMF which can be hooked to a computer. I previously mentioned um, ultrasound pulses. So why does it have to be pulses? And why can't you just keep emitting the ultrasound over the whole entire time? Well, that's because both the detector and the source of the ultrasound have the are the piezoelectric crystal. It's produced and detected by the same thing. So you have to allow it to be in pulses. You have to give one pulse, stop for a while, and then give another pulse. Um, and this has to, this is going to let the interference of the reflected and newly produced waves be mitigated. You don't want the reflected waves which are coming back and the newly produced waves which are just going out to, you know, hit each other and then affect each other and then ruin the information in some way. You want them to be completely separate from each other's paths. And that's why we use pulses so that we, there's time for the reflected waves to come back and be detected before a new pulse is sent out. Um, detection will happen in between pulses, therefore, and it allows for the reflected and the produced waves to be distinguished. So there's some additional information about the crystal. The piezoelectric crystal is made to resonate by the ultrasound, allowing the electromotive force to be formed. Um, the frequency has to be the natural frequency of the crystal so that it's going to resonate and vibrate in the biggest magnitude. You can check out my video on resonation, but if you want to take a look at it. Um, this is important because you need the biggest effect possible to have like some sort of big intensity sound wave that is produced. So that's why it's important that it's made to resonate by the natural frequency, um, which is obviously in the megahertz range. The optimal size of the crystal is half the wavelength of the ultrasound waves, lambda over 2, and for the transducer slash piezoelectric crystal, materials like quartz are used. So you might be hearing the words quartz, crystal, etc. So we've talked a lot about the general concept of what happens, but one very key element in this is that they are reflected at different boundaries. How are they reflected and why are they reflected? Well, I've previously mentioned that boundaries between materials that have different acoustic impediments or impedances will be reflecting the sound wave. So here is what acoustic impedance is. It's denoted by Z. It's basically the product of the density of the material and the speed of sound in that material, Z equals PC. Um, for instance, let's think about the you know, acoustic impedance of bones and of blood, let's say. Blood has a much lower density um, than bone, and it has a much lower speed of sound than bone. Whereas bone has extremely high density, one of the highest in the body, and therefore, because it's a solid as well, um, speed will s travel really, really, really quickly in bone. So you can see that the Z value for bone is much higher than the Z value for blood. So when the ultrasound pulse passes through various tissues or bones, they pass through different acoustic impedances, and this makes the waves reflect. The higher the difference in the Z values, the greater the intensity reflected. That means that the bones and the blood, the boundaries between bone and blood, will have an extremely high amount of reflection in that area. So that means that if you take a look at this here, let's say you have IO, which is the um, sound wave that's initially going there. A part of it is going to be transmitted onto the next part. A part of it is going to be reflected. I'm saying that because bone and blood has such a big difference between Z1 and Z2, IR is going to be extremely big. However, let's say you have a boundary between like, I don't know, fat and another tissue, they're going to have very similar densities. 
like a lot of the tissues in the body, although they are different, they have very similar densities and hence very similar speed of sound in that material as well. That means that the majority of the incident wave is going to be transmitted onto the next part of the body and very less is going to be reflected. So this is the equation for the reflection. This is like the intens intensity reflection coefficient and it's basically the intensity of the reflected wave as a fraction of the intensity of the original wave. All you have to do is denote the second z value as z2 and the first z value as z1 and follow this equation. So take a look at this for a minute. If you have bone and blood, which have very different z values, that means that z2, which is the density of bone, minus z1, is going to be basically almost z2 itself. Because this value is extremely small in proportion to this one. z2 plus z1 is also going to be almost z2. Because z1 is so small that it doesn't really make a difference. So it, this is like, if z2 is much bigger than z1, it's basically just like z2 out of z2 squared, which is 1. Which means that the intensity reflected over the intensity original is 1, which means nearly the entire wave is just going to be completely reflected. Let's take a look at another case scenario. Let's say the z2 and the z1 is very similar to each other. Then this is going to be nearly 0 which means that the intensity of the reflected wave over the intensity of the original wave is going to be nearly zero. Almost everything is transmitted, almost nothing is reflected. So at the boundary of skin and air, the Z difference is immense. And I think that is pretty self-explanatory, right? Air is just so much less dense than skin is. Most of the ultrasound will be reflected at the boundary of skin and air before it even enters the body the transmitted wave into the body will be very weak. 99.9% .9 of the air, uh, of the ultrasound wave would be reflected at the boundary of skin and air. And so if you have a weak wave going in, then the wave that comes out will also be very weak and it's going to be harder to detect and form a clear image. So we have to prevent this. In order to prevent this, a gel is applied. This has a similar Z value as skin. So if you put the transducer inside the gel, then the boundary of skin and air is basically gone. This decreases the intensity reflected at this boundary, and it allows most of the um, initial ultrasound, I think also around like 99%, is going to be able to be transmitted into the body, and this in improves the image. And so that's why you always put a gel when you are getting an ultrasound. So as the ultrasound pulse passes through the body, they are also gradually ab absorbed. And this is because, you know, the sound waves make the different molecules and the atoms inside the body vibrate, energy is dissipated, so you can basically say that the intensity is absorbed by the body. Um, and this happens by the equation I equals IO, or the original intensity, and then you have e to the power of negative alpha x and alpha is going to be the absorption coefficient and x is going to be the distance traveled so absorption coefficient is like how much a material tends to absorb the intensity of sound and then the x is how far you travel in that material and this is probably if you ever get a question on this they're going to provide these values for you all you need to do is just key it in um, and this looks very much like radioactive decay, etc. So in reality, this doesn't actually pose that big of a problem in the realm of ultrasound because the distance traveled is very small anyways. So it's actually not that big of a problem, but it's just pretty good to know. And so that's about it for uh, ultrasound in medicine. I hope it was helpful in any way. And if you want to take a look at more videos about A-level physics or high school physics in general, uh, I highly suggest you take a look at the other videos on my channel. Thank you for watching.